consumer price index. Moreover, wholesale gas spot prices have fallen by around 50% since November, and gas future prices have also come down markedly. The chart that's come up shows the MPC's central projection for inflation, which is conditional on a market-implied path for bank rate that peaks at around 4.5% by the middle of this year. In the central projection, consumer price inflation falls to around 4% towards the end of the, of the year. The purple bars on the chart illustrate that a sizable part of this fall can be explained by direct effects from energy prices. However, the expected fall in inflation is not just about energy prices. Global price pressures are easing as supply chain disruptions have lessened across most of the world. And we therefore expect headline inflation to fall rapidly based on lower external cost pressures more broadly. And this will alleviate some of the very big shock to national real income that we have had as a country. But while external pressures are easing, other indicators of inflationary pressures have proved firmer than expected. The labour market remains tight by historical standards, and annual private sector pay growth increased to 7.2% in the three months to November, which surprised on the upside. As you can see in this chart, while core goods inflation has fallen, services consumer price inflation rose to a 30-year high of 6.8% in December, above what we expected in the November monetary policy report. Bank staff project that services inflation will rise further in the near term, consistent with the strength in wages and other costs facing service sector companies. It is price and wage setting dynamics in the UK economy that ultimately determine how long it takes to return inflation to target on a sustainable basis. So while we're confident that inflation will come down this year, developments over the coming quarters will be crucial in determining how quickly overall inflationary pressures abate. Judging sustainability requires us to look further ahead, and that's where the uncertainties increase. In the Monetary Policy Committee's best collective judgment, the most likely outcome is that an increasing degree of economic slack, alongside reduced external pressures, leads consumer price inflation to fall below the 2% target from around spring 2024 next year. Besides the market-implied path for bank rate, this is conditional on wholesale energy prices following their respective futures curves over the whole forecast period. So in other words, the forecast suggests that inflation will come down and that it will fall quite sharply. But events may not unfold in this way. With inflation currently above 10%, we are in uncharted territory. Energy prices may not fall by as much as currently expected in financial markets. And even if they do, this period of very high inflation could play into price and wage setting in the UK economy to a greater extent than we assume in our central projection. The tightness of the labour market reinforces this risk. For this reason, we think the risks around our central projection for inflation shown in this chart are skewed significantly to the upside and more so than at any time in the history of the Monetary Policy Committee. Our decision to increase bank rate today, despite a weak outlook in our central projection, reflects these uncertainties. Uncertainties over the extent to which external and domestic inflationary pressures develop over the coming quarters, and wider uncertainties over the tra trajectory of the economy and inflationary dynamics further ahead. We have done a lot on rates already, the full effect of that is still to come through. But it is too soon to declare victory just yet. Inflationary pressures are still there, and we can see that in the data, and we hear it from our agents. And we need to be absolutely sure that we really are turning the corner on inflation. And that's why we've increased bank rate today. And that is why we will, of course, continue to monitor the data very carefully. Now, I want to say a few more things about the key judgments underlying the forecast, because these are important. The first key judgment is about potential supply, the level of output the economy can sustain without generating too much inflation. Over recent years, the UK economy has been hit by a series of significant economic shocks that have affected potential supply. 
This includes the change in the trading relationship with the European Union, the COVID pandemic, and developments in global energy prices related to Russia's brutal war on Ukraine and its people. These shocks have held back both productivity and labour supply. We describe our assessment of these shocks in the monetary policy report published today. I will just point to one important part of this story. As this chart shows, since the start of the COVID pandemic, we've seen a large increase in the number of people who do not take part, an active part in the labour market. Some of this rise in economic inactivity is caused by the population ageing. But as the chart shows, those aged 65 and above account for only around a third of the increase that's shown in the blue bars. There's also been a marked increase in inactivity amongst 50 to 65 year olds, that's the orange bars. Many say they've retired early, making a choice about the life they would like to live. At the same time, however, many people report that they're affected by long-term illness. A number of these people say they are unlikely to come back into the labour market. This significant and lingering fall in the labour supply weighs on the UK economy's potential. And you can see this directly in this chart. The white solid line is the participation rate, the share of people over 16 who take part in the labour market. It fell sharply with the onset of COVID, which is not unusual by international standards, but it is not reversed, which is unusual. We think this fall will take some time to unwind, so we've revised down our estimates of the trend in participation, with persistent effects from COVID adding to population ageing. As this next chart shows, as a result of the rise in inactivity, combined with the effects of the other shocks I briefly mentioned, the level of potential supply has not yet regained its pre-pandemic level. Supply growth is weak by historical standards, hence we assume that the level only recovers gradually. This is the first key judgment underlying our February forecast. The second key judgment is that the squeeze on real incomes from high energy prices and the path of market interest rates continue to weigh on demand. Economic output is therefore expected to fall slightly throughout 2023 and into 2024. This is nevertheless a much shallower decline than expected in the November monetary policy report. This chart, which we've used at recent conferences, at press conferences, shows that the projected downturn in the economy, while still technically a recession by a common definition, is now significantly milder than past recessions. That's the purple solid line, by the way. The peak to trough fall of gross domestic output in the purple line is less than 1%, which compared with 3% or more in the 1980, 1990 and 2008 recessions. That's the blue, red and yellow lines, respectively. In part, the smaller decline in output reflects the fall in energy prices, as well as the fall in the market-implied path for bank rates since the November Monetary Policy Report. And related to that, the moderation of rates on new mortgages from the elevated levels we saw in the autumn. In part, however, the shallower downturn in the forecast reflects a reassessment of the outlook for consumption in light of the strength in the labour market and upside surprise to earnings. The committee now expects a weakening in labour demand to be met to a larger extent by a reduction in vacancies and in hours worked, but to a lesser extent by an increase in redundancies and unemployment. In turn, as firms hold on to workers, households may worry less about the risk of job losses, which is likely to result in lower precautionary saving and higher consumption than previously assumed. This takes me to the third key judgment, that over the forecast period, what starts as excess demand becomes excess supply. You can see that in this chart, where we've added the projected level of output to the estimated path for potential supply. Notwithstanding the MPC's reassessment of the outlook for demand, continued headwinds lead to an increasing degree of economic slack emerging from the second quarter of this year, despite the weak outlook for supply. Finally, our fourth key judgment is on inflation. In the central projection, as I've described, the increasing degree of economic slack alongside reduced external pressures leads consumer price inflation to fall below the 2% target in the second half of the forecast. 
Now, the committee has retained a judgment from previous forecasts that, given the pressure from wage growth, inflation will be somewhat more persistent than the balance of supply and demand alone would suggest. And so this pushes up inflation a little in the central projection. While this still leaves inflation well below target in the second half of the forecast, there continue to be significant upside risks around this central projection. If wholesale energy prices remain at their current levels, for example, consumer price inflation would be nearly one percentage point higher towards the end of the forecast. And domestic wage and price dynamics could prove more persistent than the central projection implies. So the course of the economy over the coming quarters will be a key determinant of whether these risks crystallise. So to finish, this takes me back to the monetary policy decision today. Headline consumer price inflation has begun to edge back and is likely to fall sharply over the rest of the year. Now, this is, of course, very welcome. However, the labour market remains tight and domestic price and wage pressures have been stronger than expected, suggesting risks of greater persistence in underlying inflation. The extent to which inflationary pressures ease will depend on the evolution of the economy, including the impact of the significant increases in bank rates so far. There are considerable out uncertainties around the outlook. The MPC will continue to monitor closely indications of persistent inflationary pressures, including the tightness of labour market conditions and the behaviour of wage growth and services inflation. If there were to be evidence of more persistent pressures, then further tightening in monetary policy would be required. Looking further ahead, the Committee will adjust bank rate as necessary to return inflation to the 2% target sustainably. With that, Ben and Dave and I will be happy to take your questions. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, usual process for questions, please. The microphone, wait till it comes round. Please state your name and your media outlet. And we'll kick things off with Faisal and then Ashley, please. In the previous language, we had a, we had a presumption that if the economy evolved as the forecast suggested that's in November, then we expected there to be further rate increase. We also had that word forceful in there. Now, we have changed both of those points. And I think that reflects the fact that we've now got a combination of what I would call, you know, we have, we have seen a turning of the corner, but it's very early days and the risks are very large. Uh, and it's really that that I think shapes where we, you know, where we go from here. So if those risks uh, you know, emerge, and if we continue to get overshoots, uh, as we've seen in particularly uh, the, the wage data and particularly wage, wage settlement data and services inflation, then we will have to respond to that because that will be evidence that the risk, these risks are, are crystallizing. If, of course, the forecast were to, or if, of course, the economy were to evolve very much as the central case of the forecast suggests, then, of course, we would have to, you know, we would have to reevaluate as we would always do. Ben, did you want to? No, I don't think so. I mean, you'll have seen that we, you know, stressed that more persistent case, and as the governor said, the risks are still to the upside. So I don't think it's clear that, you know, it's not obvious to me looking at this or looking at what we've written that somehow. We know we've got to a point where it's a peak, or even that you know the next move is equally likely in one direction or the other. I think the committee is still very watchful uh, for signs of persistent. We've got a forecast relative to which the risks are very clearly and very significantly skewed to the upside. Um, so you know, I, I would put it with that sort of edge to it. But you're right that. Increasingly over time, given the degree to which we've already raised interest rates, these data become more, more prominent and uh, future decisions will become more sensitive to them. I don't know if you want to. Hi, Ashley Armstrong from The Sun. Um, you mentioned about inflation easing off, and obviously we've seen that on um, kind of commodity prices and obviously shipping, but food inflation, which is obviously an essential for all the households, is actually at a record high. So wondering how that feeds into your kind of estimation of the pain for households. And also, um, do, do your, does your models also take into account the uh, reduction in government support for businesses coming from April on the energy support? Because what we're hearing from a lot of businesses is that they're very nervous about that. And while 
redundancies have been very low so far, once that help is removed or certainly lessened, they might have to take action? Yes, we do. Um, uh, and, and you're right. I mean, it is, it is quite a sort of complicated picture when you look at the, the combination of the effects of the quite sharp fall in energy prices, the government's uh, support package that is in place uh, up until April, I think, I think I'm right in saying, and, and how those things interact month by month. Um, and so I think I'm right in saying that, of course, at the moment, the, the level of household energy prices is, is really sort of fixed by that sort of ceiling that, that's put on. That when that ceiling comes off under the current prices, I think the, you know, the, there might be a sort of one month, what I might call gap, where prices adjust, and then we would expect prices to, to, to come down much more according to the off jam cap, which will reflect the market curve. Uh, and I would just take, go back to something I said quite early on in my remarks, that that is also you know, an important part of the, of the story, that inflation falls more rapidly in the second half of this year than it does in the first half of this year, the slope. And of course, by the way, a big part of that is that inflation is an annual calculation, so you've got to relate all of this back to what happened last year. Just very quickly on, on food, there's a, there's a graph yeah. in the report, 2.4, which has some of the underlying wholesale commodity prices. Um, we don't forecast the components of inflation beyond the very near term, so I can't tell you what the forecast embodies overall in terms of food prices, but you can see that you saw very steep rises in wholesale. These are in dollar terms, but same was true in sterling. Very steep rises in agricultural commodity prices, you know, 30% sort of thing, um, during 2021, um, and they've sort of come back down and leveled out since. So in time, I think one would expect these very high rates of food inflation to start dissipating and prices to level off. Um, but you're right, you know, it, it's a big part of the inflation currently as are more generally these prices of global traded goods. I mean, I think just to finish, I mean, if we look at sort of the big, what I call the big three external shocks that we've seen, I mean, on mm -hmm. first of all, the supply chain shock post COVID, then the, the energy shock and then the food shock, I would say they're in different sort of fa phases of, 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 of their sort of evolution. So I think the supply, the global supply chain shock, I think is now sort of clearly coming off and indeed probably has been for about the last year. Uh, energy, we've, we've, we've talked about, I mean, you know, we see it, you know, now coming off, but it's at a much earlier stage. And food, I think Ben's absolutely right. I mean, we've got this you know, really situation where we, we see at the sort of commodity price level things flattening out, but we haven't yet seen it coming through into the consumer price index. And if I can just supplement that, I mean, we, as we, I mean, we have a chart that shows, chart 2.19 shows that food price inflation is contributing more and more to the overall level of inflation. And so, I mean, as a, as a committee, we're acutely conscious, you know, particularly for poorer households, you know, the share of their consumption that is food and is energy, yep. these necessities. Um, so we're very conscious of, of the challenges that, that are being faced. Um, your point on redundancies is, is exactly right in terms of where the data has got to so far. We are forecasting a pickup in unemployment from the current very low levels. One of the drivers for why we have a more, uh, it's still a, technically a recession. I think we've got a, a peak to trough fall in GDP now of just under 1%. So it might meet the technical definition of a recession. Uh, but it is much milder, as Andrew was saying, than we previously had. But we, a, a key driver of why it's milder is that we have changed our judgment on where unemployment is, uh, how much unemployment is going to rise. So we still have it rising through this year, but it now rises uh, by the end of the forecast period to just over 5%, whereas back in November we had it rising to some way over 6%. So things are going to be challenging and tough, um, but the, the recession that we, we still have in, in, in the data is, is milder than it was. So far, your agents have identified little sign of people returning to the labour market due to cost of living pressures. 
does that, does that suggest that government efforts to get people back into work may prove futile? And what do you suggest is the best way to approach this? Well, I'm not, I'm not, we do not, <coughs> not presume to be the experts on um, what I might call sort of more microeconomics of, uh, of, in, of, of the labour market in that sense. Um, I would also say, I, I think, you know, from the point of view of government policy, that of course it's, it's early days. I think this, you know, this issue has really surfaced in the last sort of last months. Um, and so, in terms of the policies on the labour market, I, you know, I think there's, you know, there's, there's a clear intention by the government to, you know, to, to do some more. But it's early days at this stage. I think what we see, and, and, and you know, we get this from you know, talking to a lot of people, is, uh, as I said, first of all. I mean, there's two things going on here. Obviously, there is a natural... I mean, the, the population is ageing. Um, and so that, you know, that would have happened irrespective of COVID, uh, for instance. So we have to take, obviously, that, that into account. And part of that, I'd say, that would have happened anyway, as it were. The second thing, however, we observe is, is, is that, as I said, is that in the UK, and this is not the case in, the, in other countries... What was a fall in participation in the early part of COVID has not, rever has not reversed course. And, and that's what makes the UK stand out, really. Now, what I would say is that I think the evidence certainly suggests that while there is an increasing part of the population that, when asked why it is not returning to the labour market, cites uh, long-term health conditions, I don't think that's the proximate reason what, for given for leaving the labour force. So there is this sort of, if you like, time gap in that sense. Um, so it's important, it seems to me, that you know, we know a, you know a lot more collectively from a public policy point of view about why this is happening and, and what could be done to reverse it. But that's, I say that's getting beyond our area of expertise after that, I would say. A comment from Sky News. Earlier on this week, no doubt you'll have seen, there was an IMF forecast for, for the global economy. Um, there was lots of focus on what happened to the UK. Um, the UK seemed in their forecast to be quite an outlier. I just wanted to know, you know, do you or the bank agree with that assessment? Clearly this, this forecast is about the UK, but I just wonder, does it feel like we're an outlier? Does it feel like we're doing so much worse than everyone else? And also, you know, what are the reasons if so? Um, I'll come in, Ed. Um, I mean, we, our, our forecast for UK growth are weaker this calendar year. Um, than the euro area or the US. Um, but I think one needs to be quite careful about just taking a snippet of time. I mean, we look to grow more strongly than the euro area in 2022 and in 2021. And over those three years as well, 21, 22, and 23 together, in our forecast and the IMS forecast. So, you know, there's, there's a reasonable amount of volatility over short periods of time, and you need to be careful in general about those comparisons. Uh, having said that, I think there are a couple of things that could have contributed to the relative weakness of the UK that are not just pure noise. One, the governor was talking about a moment ago, which is the fact that participation hasn't come back here in the same way it has elsewhere. We don't, as, as Andrew said, we don't fully understand why, but it's a fact. Another is that the UK is probably more dependent on, in fact, is more dependent on gas. And there's a huge difference, as you know, between the behavior of gas prices in Europe and the United States. So that explains a big part of the gap between growth here and in the euro area compared with the US. But we're even more dependent than continental Europe. We think of France with all its nuclear power stations, for example. So I think that's another part of it. Uh, it may also be, and this is what um, Peo, the, the IMS chief economist, said, the faster transmission of monetary policy. All those things, uh, the participation, the effect of higher gas prices, and even the faster transmission of monetary policy are not things that will endure forever. Uh, so I don't think this had, the, the, you know, one should expect this to tell you about trends over the next four or five years. Brexit. Well, Brexit is, as, as Andrew said in his opening remarks, has been something that has pulled down potential output in our country in our assessment. That's been our assessment for many years, as you know. And we have brought, we've not changed our estimate of the long run effects, but we've brought some of them forward. 
we think probably they're coming in faster than we first expected, even if the long-run effect is no different. Again, I'm not sure that's going to help you explain why growth is weaker having, than the Eurozone in 2023, having been stronger in 2022. Um, but it, you know, over periods of time, yes, it's having some effect on growth, although ultimately and cumulatively no bigger an effect than we, we assessed some years ago. Um, but you're, you're right that you know, based on the numbers for trade and some degree on the numbers for investment, we think those effects have come through somewhat faster than we initially mm. envisaged. It's interesting when you look at the profile with the IMF, because in our profile, was that I would say I think we're pretty similar this year. We've both got pretty sort of, yeah. you know, small negative numbers. Actually, the difference is what happens thereafter, I think, which is that they have growth picking up more rapidly than we do. That's the difference, really, that stands out. Well, the, what you... It's both... Um, the underlying supply factors that yeah. Ben was just describing and that Andrew talked about in his opening remarks. Um, you know, we've done this supply stock take. We have got relatively weak supply growth um, further out, weaker than uh, pre, you know, the, than the averages we saw that prior to the pandemic. That's actually largely driven by uh, the part the the lower participation that Andrew was, was talking about. Um, different forecasters, that's on the supply side, different forecasters will, will have different assessments of, of the pace of the recovery as we come out of the recession. So you know, that's, that, that, that's, that's to be expected given the different judgments we make. Phil and Artie. Uh, Larry Elliott of The Guardian. Um, Governor, you say that it's too early to claim victory in the war against inflation. I just wondered what things you would require to happen to declare that victory. Would it be uh, a moderation in private sector pay claims or a rise in unemployment? And if so, wouldn't that be a curious sort of victory for the people affected by the current cost of living crisis? Well, that's a good question, Larry. So I would sort of, what am I call it, if you put it into our forecasts, the central case and the risks. So on the central case, as I said, I think you know, we do need to see that you know, these very sort of pronounced, you know, to use the technical term, base effects that are pushing, in, particularly on energy, that are pushing inflation down. Now, you know, they are sort of, if you like, sort of you know, baked in, unless obviously we get some surprise that I think none of us know about and I, you know, in, 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 the, in the world at large. And unfortunately, I say that because we've obviously had quite a few of them in recent years, but other, other, other things equal. That, you know, that story is important, but I think we put greater confidence on, on its evolving. So then I think we come to the risks, uh, um, as you said, Larry. Now, I, I want to be quite clear. I mean, it's, it's not... Um, uh, a case was certainly not a case of us wanting, you know, stronger, stronger unemployment. For instance, we've we've revised, as, as, as we've been saying, you know, we've revised the unemployment profile. What I would say is that we have been surprised um, on the upside by private sector wage settlements, so that they are you know, they are higher than we thought they would be in the November uh, the November report. That is that is the case. Um, now, if you look, however, at two other things, you get a slightly different story. So that's looking at year-on-year -year comparisons. If you, look, if, you re if you redo those numbers to sort of look at them more high frequency, so if you do three months on three months or so on, you, you, you get a story that it looks as if it's flattening. And then you take the survey evidence, um, which we obviously look at in intently, um, you see some clear signs in some surveys that it, the position is, 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 is weakening. Um, so we will be watching those things very carefully because they are going to have a very important influence. I mean, you know, what goes on in the labour market at the moment uh, is going to be a very important determinant, and particularly, I would say, in pay settlements. You also, by the way, you know, care about the pricing side. Yes. Mm. You know, and Andrew showed you a graph earlier with services prices. We choose that not because we care particularly about services, but they tend to be more persistent. It's not simply about wages. And the truth is that when they bid each other up, we don't end up better off. You know, what's happened here is that faced with this massive real income squeeze, which is a result of war pandemic, even if the pandemic effects are now fading, 
the attempt to claw that back for firms to maintain the real value of the profits, for employees to maintain the real value of their wages. Collectively, that's not possible. Our real national income is inescapably lower as a result of these shocks. And what happens instead is you get this period of inflation. So it's not that we you know, intrinsically want lower real wage growth. I don't think we can ultimately do much about the level of real wages. It's that both wages and prices are telling us about the strength of this reaction and therefore the ultimate persistence of overall inflation. And I would say, I would just add when, certainly when you know, we go around the country with the agents, and I certainly go around the country with the agents, I would say the story has evolved, and I think certainly now we hear more stories from, uh, from businesses that they are finding price, more resistance to price setting than certainly I would say we were picking up, you know, some months ago. Um, Artin Archipin from The Times. Um, you've conditioned your forecasts on the reduction in energy price support planned for April that would see prices go up to 3,000 on average. Now, the Chancellor's under pressure to either mitigate or remove that that increase due to the the lack of the less the lesser subsidies they have to pay out because of the fall in natural gas prices now if there were to be a maintenance of the support at its current level or a smaller increase that's to say below 3000 how far would this go to lowering your your forecast for the recession or what impact would it have on your forecast for inflation growth and unemployment well, Ben, I should Ben wants to come in. I, I mean, I would say this, that there are very, and you saw it, I think, in the first chart we showed, there are very big energy effects in this forecast. So I would, you know, I would tend to say that the cumulative consequence of any further change is going to be quite a lot smaller than the effects we've already got, because the big ones are in there. I don't know what you want to... No, no, no. Say is it, remember that the wholesale price has come down so much that the implied retail price... I can't remember exactly when this happened, but at some point, not in the far, terribly far distant future, when it comes down below the level of the energy price guarantee, yeah. assuming the same off-gem pricing mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. So at that point, it doesn't really make any difference. It, it would do in the, in the near term, because currently, you know, what would have been the off-gem price is a good deal higher than the cap. The cap is definitely binding at the moment, but... You know, if you look further ahead, I can't remember exactly. I think it's late spring, early summer. I think that that, that, then that starts. The wholesale happen, price yeah. has fallen sufficiently that it doesn't yeah. really make that much difference. Yeah. And so, in terms of the medium-term forecast, it would make some, but I'm not sure a huge yeah. amount. Yeah. Chris and Phil. Chris Giles from the Financial Times, Governor. It's pretty unusual for the MPC to put aside its inflation forecast when making rates decision, even the risk-adjusted inflation forecast. And the minority on the committee said that they thought enough had been done and that would require then bringing forward rate cuts which might be larger than otherwise accepted. Are you comfortable with putting aside the inflation forecast? And is this just one more heave and you're comfortable with maybe having to cut rates quite soon more than you otherwise would have to? Uh, can I, uh, can I, if you don't mind, interpret your, your phrase, put to one side the forecast? I, I'll give you my, my view on this. I mean, every member of the committee could obviously view this differently because the forecast is an input to our policy decision. It's not, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not an as night follows day thing. Uh, and so my own view on this is as follows. If you ask me the question, which is a relevant question to ask, do I think this forecast is my best judgment of what it's like to have better than any other judgment I could make? I would say the answer to that is clearly yes. We spent a lot of time on this forecast. Now, the however, and this is relevant to your question, so it's not I set it to one side and decided to do something completely different. It really comes back to what I said in the, the beginning, which is I, for my part, I think there is, there is a, such a high level of uncertainty at the moment around how this is going to evolve uh, that I need to see more evidence that we are going down that route, and particularly with the scale of the risks we have around inflation. And we, as I said, we've got the largest upside risk on inflation in the history of the MPC. That I need to see more evidence that that, you know, that, that is going to evolve as, 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 as the central case of the forecast would indicate. And, and as I said earlier, if the central, if it, you know, if it evolves, if the economy evolves as the central case of the forecast suggests, then of course we will set policy according to that 
you know, that situation, and we will respond accordingly. And while you know we've emphasised uh, you know the, the risks, uh, yeah, I, I've just come back to the point and said it, you know it is it is the case that we have changed the language in the monetary policy statement that we've used, and, and that's quite deliberate. I mean, I think Chris, you know the fact. I mean, I certainly didn't put the forecast to one side. Um, and the skew is sufficiently big that the mean projection for inflation under the market path of interest rates, which, by the way, has another, for what it's worth, it doesn't say anything about what we will do, but that market path has another, you know, it's a little bit higher in the near term, even if subsequently it comes off. Based on that market profile, the mean forecast for inflation, as opposed to the MO, uh, is pretty close to target at two years. And... I think it's, it's difficult if, for people who believe, and I'm not saying I do one way or other, I think it probably are on the committee, that the things we assume in the forecast, for example, the stability of inflation expectations, the rootedness that pulls us towards the target and wrong, themselves depend on what we do. I'm not sure I would put it, but there are people who believe that. Then it's a slightly odd thing. In order to secure uh, that medium term... In the modal forecast, okay. yes. Well, I mean, it's just about, it's pretty close at two years. You're right, beyond two years, it continues to fall. That's Great, true. Before Dave wants to go, I just want to remind one thing I said in the introductory remarks, and that yeah. is, yeah, we, we, we switched a few rounds ago to the, uh, using the full, well, actually in November, didn't we, to using the full futures curve for energy prices. Actually, that was That's true. necessary because otherwise we would have got a very strange profile of energy prices using the, the so-called random walk assumption that we use. But I did say, if you plug the random walk assumption back in, the one we used to use, you get about 1% higher inflation. Let's give you an idea of the risk. Gives you a sense of the Dave, sorry. Yeah, I was, well, you, you've said one of the points I was going to make, but it does go to the, the more general framing for, the, for, for, the, for this set of policy decisions, which for me, we're not putting the forecast to one side, but the forecast is a very important input into our decisions. But we've had to deal with these shocks that we've been talking about and the impacts that they have. I mean, if you remember when we were back here in November... We had to put a lot, of for, a lot of focus on the conditioning assumptions for our forecast because you know, what had happened in September and October last year uh, with you know, financial market reactions to the then government's decisions, what was happening with energy prices, these were challenging things for us in terms of setting out our view of the future. I mean, I'm certainly not putting the forecast to one side, but given the uncertainties, as Andrew says, I think I probably have more confidence uh, with the immediate period ahead than I do with where things are going to go two or three years out, given the risks. Um, I mean, one specific thing, and it goes back to Ed's point, I mean, we, we, we haven't got the detail of the IMF update, but we think that they've assumed more persistence in inflation, which is also what, sh what gives them more activity, if you like. They've got, you know, they've got, you know, more, more wage and price pressures, that feeds through actually in the, in the way they put their forecasts together to more demand. W what we're trying to do is, um, w another area of uncertainty for us, is the supply stock take. I mean, we, Andrew set out in detail, and in, in even more detail in the In Focus chapter, this assessment of potential supply but, you know, it is affected by these shocks, and it's, it's quite possible that potential supply could turn out to be more positive than we've got it over the next three years, or the shocks could hit even harder. And so we, we're, you know, we're, we're having... It, it's not like it was, say, back pre the, uh, the global financial crisis, where potential supply was pretty steady, grew, it grew, and demand moved around it. We've now got more moving parts, more shocks that we're having to deal with, which which prompts quite reasonable questions like yours, but I think, it's, but it, it, I think you need to bear with us that we're sort of, we're using the forecast, but we're having to use it in a rather more nuanced way than, say, we did in the first 10 years of the MPC. Hi, uh, Phil Aldrich at Bloomberg uh, News. Uh, just... Um, to your, to your earlier point that inflation pressures need to be pr need to prove a little bit more persistent than you uh, are currently projecting to, to 
require uh, further policy reaction. Um, you also predict uh, through the agent's report a 6% increase in uh, pay settlements, a record high this year. Does that imply that 6% uh, pay rises are sustainable um, with the inflation target over the long term? And just on potential output, we've got 0.7% trend rate of growth, which when was, when was the UK uh, long-term performance ever as bleak as that? Well, there was something I'm, I'm sure Ben wants to come in. On, on pay settlements, I just want, uh, it might be useful to just give you a flavour of the, we, as you, I think you may know, at the beginning of each calendar year, our agents do a pay survey, and we, we draw on that to, for the forecast, and uh, as we have done this time. And 6% is, 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 in a way, quite similar to numbers they were telling us sort of in the, sort of, throughout some parts of last year. But what they did tell us this time is that you know, firms are telling them that they would expect that number to sort of come off as the year goes on um, somewhat. I mean, firms are not that, I mean, it's too early, I think, for firms to be very precise about that. But that's, that's I think, what they think is the sort of the direction, if you like, of the overall movement. So I think that's important to bear in mind in terms of, you know, how it might evolve. Uh, ben, do you want to say Yeah, no, I mean, the simple answer to your question is 6% sustainable. The answer is with or consistent with a 2% inflation target and productivity growth of 101 or something. The answer is obviously no, but then we don't expect the pay growth to stay at that level. Um, and that's why, you know, in the medium term inflation, including underlying core and stuff like that, that also comes down. Just to show you something that's consistent with what the government has said about the very the higher frequency news, if you look at 2.23, which is a graph of various indicators of pay growth, alongside the official series, which happens to be in the sort of light blue color in this thing, um, there are some that are, are coming off, some that we look at. So, you know, as I say, two-part answer, no, 6% is not consistent, but then we don't think it's going to stay there. No, no, but and then, look, the forecast has something close to that for the end of this year, and still it has subsequently inflation coming back down to target. Okay. And if I could just come in on the potential supply point, Phil. I mean, we set out on page 75, tab table 3A, the, the forecasts that you're referring to, I think for the three years of the forecast, we have potential supply averaging just under one. It's 0.7 in the, in the final year. As I said earlier, and consistent with what Andrew was saying in his opening remarks, the driver of that is actually um, potential labor supply growth. If you look at the productivity line, it's growth is averaging below one, but then it averaged 0.5 in the decade from 2010 to 2019. And if you're looking for, a, I mean, we don't, we show in the columns here, we have the pre-global financial crisis decade, 97 to 07, when growth was a lot stronger. Then we show the period since 2010. I'm hazarding a guess here, but I would think potential supply growth was pretty weak in the period from 2007 to 2010, given the credit crunch, given the shocks that were hitting the global economy from the financial crisis. You'd have to kind of go back to look at that, but that would be my, whether it would be as weak as we're forecasting is, is another matter. But the point is, as, as Andrew was emphasizing, what's driving it, potential supply to look so unusually weak is labor supply growth rather than productivity, which has actually sadly been weak for, for many, many years. Bill and Maureen. Uh, yeah, Bill Schomburg from Reuters. Um, just ties right into the question I was going to ask. Um, the, the outlook is weak. You know, got the economy barely growing this year. Uh, sorry, contracting this year, contracting next year, barely growing in 2025. Uh, you've got this very weak um, supply. I mean, uh, potential growth rate. Is labor supply really the, the, the key to this? Can you perhaps illustrate what would happen to the growth, to the supply, the, the growth potential of the economy if we were to, able to get activity back to the levels before the pandemic? And to secondary, um, a second question, uh, did anybody argue in favor of keeping the word forcefully in the statement? Well, I'm, I'm not going to answer the second question, I'm afraid, directly because we don't sort of, in a sense, give away that level of detail in the discussion, because what emerges is, uh, is, you know, is, the, is the view of the committee, and particularly the view 
um, of a majority of the committee. So it's important, I think, that we, you know, we, we, we sort of preserve that in terms of the argument, because you'll, you, see the, you see the outcome, as it were, and the outcome is the word forceful does not appear in there, and that's, that's important. I think in terms of labor supply, where I, or sorry, in terms of the supply side, where I would start from, I think Dave really has, in a sense, just answered the question in a way, which is the, the position on uh, labor supply is uh, unusually weak. Now, part of that, as we've been saying, I think we have to accept or rec recognize is a long-term feature of an, aging, of an aging population. So, I mean, going back to what I was saying earlier, I think you know, it would have happened whether COVID had happened or not. Um, but that is not the only part of it. There is clearly another substantial part of it in terms of inactivity, and that's the, going to be the importance, therefore, of a, it seems to me, of, uh, of tackling that labour supply issue. But as Dave was also saying, I mean, you look at the history of product, you know, the productivity; it has, uh, you know, it has varied uh, the time, and it is, you know, it's been it's been weak in the last decade or so uh, since the financial crisis. And I think that just to say. We put some of this in the in-focus chapter. What's clearer now is just how weak manufacturing productivity yes. has been on the latest vintage of, of data. And we, we posit some, some potential um, reasons and hypotheses for why it's, it's been so weak. But compared to, say, five years ago when people were talking about the productivity puzzle a lot and, and right that they should continue to do so it does look more focused on manufacturing now less say on you know trends in financial services pre and post the global financial crisis those actually haven't changed as much it's manufacturing which really seems to be uh, bearing the brunt in terms of the uk productivity story i think you just emphasize dave's important distinction between labour side and productivity. In theory, what matters for real wages is productivity. For the aggregate, labour supply matters too. But if you think about sort of per capita things and average wages are a per capita concept, it's productivity that matters more. And as Dave pointed out, our forecasts are not much weaker. So in the important respect to the question that Phil asked, the answer is that unfortunately they've been that bleak for a while. There's a productivity growth, which is what matters more for, as I say, for the growth of real earnings, real wages. Hi, um, Mehreen Khan from The Times. Uh, a question about the, the long-term productivity, um, the supply projections. Can you explain what you mean when you say Brexit is having a, maybe a faster impact than you would have suggested, but no overall um, difference in the overall impact? Um, and also, have you begun to disentangle the Brexit impact on labour supply? So the bank has consistently said that you know, EU workers are non-fungible in the sense that the migrants coming from outside the EU are not necessarily filling the jobs that we used to have filled by people who are taking benefit of, of the free movement of people. Um, did you underestimate that impact, that non-fungibility? And is that also driving parts of the labour supply? Mm. And just a, a general question about the, the impact of supply and falling supply. There's an argument that secular stagnation will become re return as the norm uh, in the next few years, potentially when interest rates are normalised. Um, would your projections on the state of the UK's long-term trend growth suggest that secular stagnation would also return? to the UK? Well, I was, I was, let, me, let me make a couple of points. Um, We've only got nine more minutes. Ah. <laughs> On Brexit, um, let me two points. Um, it is unusual, it is very hard at the moment to separate out, I think, in any, any sort of precise way, the effects of Brexit, COVID, and uh, the energy crisis. We've, we've got these shocks going on together, I mean, shocks in the sort of technical sense there. I think our best judgment at the moment is, and I think you, you, you captured it actually, is that um, it, it, we haven't necessarily changed our view of the long run impact from the one we set out some years ago, but the, but the long run impact seems to have come through more quickly. That seems to be the evidence indeed. Yeah, it, by the end of the forecast horizon, uh, as things stand, that long run impact would have come through. Yeah. We had an overall estimate of, I can't remember, on productivity, three, three, and, a, quarter, three and a quarter, quarter percent. Quarter, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. We had it coming through pretty gradually, and we just think we're getting to that number slightly faster. That's all. Yeah. Given the evidence we see, on it's the possible that you know um, the effects of you know relative changes in migration from one part of the world to another have affected that. But I don't think we can say definitively that that's no. been the case. Jack. Uh, 
Um, Jack Barnett from City AM. We've obviously talked quite a lot about the supply side um, weakness and mainly its impact on on growth. I'm just wondering whether or not the committee had a view on the impact of inflation in the long run. You've obviously mentioned that quite a lot of the problem has been um, we're going into an Asian society now and participation is naturally falling um, in response to that. Does that mean we're also going into a period of potentially higher inflation? So, I mean, in the end, demand will match supply. Right? So we, I don't think there's any particular reason to think that. I mean, there are lots of, you've seen lots of variations in the rates at which societies age. I, I, I can't think off the top of my head there's any particular correlation with inflation. Uh, so I, I don't think that need be the case. No. I mean, that, it's, it's, sorry, I was going to say it probably has been true in our forecast and our assessment that this early retirement as opposed to the stuff that's been very long, just, just a result of aging, may have had an, an effect on the gap between yes. demand and supply. Because when people age, when people retire, forgive me, their saving rates suddenly fall. And so if suddenly someone brings forward that date, it may have contributed to some degree to the uh, current rates of, of inflation, to a bit. I mean, nothing like the extent to which energy and food prices have done. And I think Hugh made that point. Yeah, and uh, I mean, you can, I don't think we would make, well, I mean, some people describe, and probably I have in the past, you know, potential supply as being some kind of speed limit on the economy. And we would recognise that it, you know, it is the level of output the economy can sustain without adding to inflationary pressures. That may have applied recently for the reasons um, Ben says, but I think more generally when you look at our forecast, we're opening up over the next three years, we're opening up spare capacity, as Andrew was saying, i.e. demand is weaker than supply. So as you move further out in our forecast, it's certainly not acting as a, it's not constraining growth. However, your more general long-term point, if you can get potential supply up, that means that the economy can grow at a faster rate over the long term. So it's definitely worth any policies that will increase labour supply or will increase productivity. Those have been yeah. the focus of successive governments ever since I've you know, been working in the public sector, which is over 30 years. So it's, it, 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 that's not a new idea that you're trying to increase potential supply in the economy. It's just it's very weak at the moment. Um, John Paul Ford has from the Daily Mail. Um, the NPR talks about um, the impact of um, fiscal tightening. Uh, and tax rises and um, specific policies introduced in the November um, autumn statement and it suggests that the impact of these will by the end of the period reduce the level of GDP by 0.4% um, so it seems like you're saying that fiscal policy tax rises fiscal tightening is effectively a handbrake on, on growth and is this a frustration um, for you as you formulate monetary policy, particularly with the outlook for GDP stagnating um, all the way through to 2026. And a supplementary one is just about market reaction today on the path of interest rate. Uh, interest rate suggests that it's only going to go up to 4.25% uh, later this year. If there's any reaction, any comment? Well, let me say a word on fiscal policy. I mean, I don't even want to get on the market rates. Uh, let me say two things. One, um, and what you see from, I think, the, the chart you're referring to is that fiscal policy is, and we obviously, let me say, condition all our views on announced and, and, and announced government policy. We don't, we don't do anything other than that. And what you see, of course, is that fiscal policy does move from being somewhat supportive to then tightening as, as time goes by, and that's consistent, I think, with the Chancellor's announcements you know, last, late last year. Um, and, and that... That brings me to the second point, which, of course, is that it is important that we have sustainable fiscal policy. I'm going to, you know, that's, that's the furthest point I'll make as a central bank governor, but it is important that we have sustainable fiscal policy. And just on your other point, um, we took the very unusual step, extremely unusual step in November of commenting on market curves, but I'm afraid normal, from your perspective, normal services resumed and we're not going to comment at all on market reactions. Oh, well done.
labor market may mean that inflation doesn't quite fall to 2% for a long time? Well, let me, uh, let me, let, let me put the word long time to, to one side and come back to that. I, I think, you know, I think we've laid out pretty clearly that there is a, one of the risks that we've identified in the profile of inflation comes from the tightness of the labor market. Uh, and we see that both in, in the quantities and the prices. We see that both in terms of, of the overshoots in pay settlements and the fact that uh, if you take you know, something like the vacancy to unemployment ratio, while it has come off somewhat, it remains very high by, uh, by historical standards. So there is tightness in the labour market, and of course it also goes back to the supply side question that we've been talking about a lot during this, uh, during this conference. Um, so, yes, that is, that is a big risk, and we are you know, going to have to watch it very carefully. I'll come back to I think, what I said earlier on, which is um, in terms of you know, watching the data. We watch all the data, but if you ask me which, which, which data are going to be particularly uh, significant in the, in the period to come, you know, the labor market would, would certainly for me be well up there. Now, I, 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 would have, I, I would sort of not go to the sort of a very long-term interpretation of your phrase long-term, because I think... Yeah, ben was saying earlier, there are a lot of other factors come into play there. Um, as Dave was saying, I mean, it's important as we're seeing that, that public policy and this is government policy, of course, you know, is, is you know, increasingly focusing on this question of labour participation. Welcome that. It's important. So I think that's the, that's the caveat I would have to your long term point. Over the long term, we will set policy to ensure inflation is at the target. Yes. Isha Nelson from the New York Times. Um, yesterday, the Federal Reserve said, you know, a few more rate increases and then they're going to reevaluate. The ECB just said one more and then reevaluate. You just said, you know, we're turning a corner here. Do you have any concern that globally financial markets might decide to declare victory for you um, earlier than you're ready for and start loosening conditions in a way that makes it harder to restrain kind of the restrictions you need to ensure that inflation goes down over that kind of medium term period? Well, the message, I mean, the message, you know, for everybody, I mean, financial markets included, I think, is this. Um, yeah, there is a the very clear path downwards in inflation. And as I said to Chris, um, if you ask me, is, you know, is, is that your most likely path? I would say yes, but there is a lot of uncertainty around it. There's uncertainty both around, around actually the, the degree of risk and the timing as well. And I, you know, the message I would give to financial markets is that I think you have to watch this. You know, we all have to watch this very carefully, and we will set policy to reflect you know, how, how the economy evolves and how those risks evolve. Just one point of clarification. You said, I mean, I'm not going to comment on whether, that what they actually said, but you made some comments about what the other central banks have said about their own policy rate. And then you said that we've said we've turned a corner. The turned a corner was with respect to headline inflation. Yes. It wasn't a remark about bank rate, no. just to be clear. Mm. So they're not quite like for like, those comparisons. The only other thing I'd say is probably we think the role of equity prices in particular, the effects of those on growth are probably bigger in the United States than they are here. So there's a lot of emphasis on that FCI stuff. And we look at them, certainly, um, but I don't think they necessarily capture what we believe the whole stance of policy uh, on the economy and ultimately on inflation. Great. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks.